Kwe, hello and good afternoon. I would like to start by welcoming you to the first of the 2021 Indigenous Women Speaker Series on Decolonization and Health. And we will begin with a virtual territorial acknowledgement. As this meeting is virtual and we are not all gathered in the same space, I recognize that this land acknowledgement might not be for the territory that you are currently on. We ask that if this is the case, you take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory you are on and the current treaty holders. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of our institution. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tekoronto has been caretaken by the uh, Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Windat. It is now home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is an agreement to peacefully share and care for this Great Lakes region. Um, just one moment, I just lost my talk. This land acknowledgement is the beginning of responsibilities incumbent upon York University administrators, faculty and students, including within the university. The Center for Feminist Researchers uh, Indigenous Women Speaker Series, now in its fourth year, is part of this responsibility for making space in the academy for Indigenous women's and Indigenous feminist voices. The Center for Feminist Research is therefore pleased to co-organize today's talk following the inaugural CFR lecture with Cree-speaking Métis feminist and poet Emma Rock the second lecture with professors Deborah McGregor, Karen Rickley, and Cheryl Suzak, and the third lecture with Professor Joyce Green. My name is Elaine Coburn, and I am a guest on Indigenous lands. I'm also the director of the Center for Feminist Research at York University. Today, I am very pleased to introduce my co-organizer for this event, Professor Sean Hillier, who is a Mi'kmaq scholar from the Kalapu First Nation, who resides in the School of Health Policy Management and serves as, as the Special Advisor to the Dean of Health on Indigenous Resurgence and Chair of the Indigenous Council at York University. This lecture series continues to mark an important historical moment for the School of Health Policy and Management, the Faculty of Health, and York University more broadly in its, in its demonstration of the commitment to coming together with prominent Indigenous scholars to listen and to learn. Through this process, may we begin to understand the impact of colonization on the spaces and places in which we study, we live, and we work. We would like to thank the co-sponsors for this event, uh, the Center for Feminist Research and the Faculty of Health, as well as the Provost Office through the Indigenous Teaching and Learning Fund. The format for today's event will be a lecture by Professor J. Kawalani Kawanui, of about 45 minutes, followed by 30 minutes or so of moderated questions and answers. During the lecture, please feel free to submit your question using the Q&A function. Elaine and I will be moder monitoring it throughout the event and we will take select questions to uh, our um, esteemed guest here with us today. Today's talk is entitled, Hawaiian Decolonizing and the Enduring Question of Feminism. Professor Kawalani Kawanui is a, is a faculty member at Wesleyan University, where she teaches courses in Indigenous studies, critical race studies, settler colonial studies, and, Ar and anarchist studies. She is the author of Hawaiian Blood, Colonialism and the Politics of Sovereignty and Indigeneity through Duke University Pre uh, Press, which was published in 2008. A decade later, she released Paradoxes of Hawaiian Sovereignty, Land, Sex, and the Colonial Politics of State Nationalism, also through Duke University Press. She's also the editor of Speaking in Indigenous Politics, Conversations with Activists, Scholars, and Tribal Leaders with the University of Minnesota Press, which emerged from a radio program she produced and hosted for, uh, for seven years called Indigenous Politics from Native New England and Beyond that was widely syndicated through the Pacific Network. She recently served as a co-producer for the anarchist poli uh, politics show called Anarchy on, on Air, a majority person of color show co-produced with a group of uh, Wesleyan students, which builds on her earlier work 
on another collaborative anarchist program called Horizontal Power Hour. She is also one of six co-founders of the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association. She is currently completing a book manuscript provisionally titled Indigenous Implications, U.S. Settler Colonialism and Palestinian Solidarity Politics, an intervention in how U.S.-based solidarity activists engage in, a, in the boycott, divestment and sanctions BDS movements uh, targeting Israel um, situate Pal uh, Palestine and the ethics of challenging one settler colonial state while situated in another. Professor J. Kawalani Kawanui combines analytical acuity in challenging settler colonialism with a decidedly non-romantic critical appraisal of Hawaiian sovereignty. Her reflections on land, sex, and anarchy, quite a trio, are never facile but reveal with brilliance a sense of possible Indigenous futures and solidarity with all those who struggle against oppression. And we're very pleased now uh, to welcome our guest. Thank you. Thank you both so very much for having me. Can everybody hear me? Or can my host hear me? All right. Thank you very much for the warm and generous welcome. I um, appreciate the invitation to present my work in this forum. This is the second invited talk I uh, will have delivered at a Canadian institution in a non-conference setting. And I'm really excited. I want to also thank people who are tuning in and attending this virtual webinar, especially because I know there are many other places uh, people could be. And also, I want to acknowledge that we are still in the middle of a ravishing um, global pandemic, and I hope people are keeping well. Before I launch into my talk, I too want to uh, offer a land acknowledgement to uh, recognize the Wangunk people of the land I'm currently occupying. The traditional place name here is Mattabesset, now commonly known as Middletown, Connecticut. I understand land acknowledgements are getting a bad rap these days as an empty liberal gesture, and understandably so, particularly in contrast to the rallying call for land back. However, this is a part of my own Indigenous Hawaiian protocol shared by Kanaka Maoli, that is Indigenous Hawaiian elders over 30 years ago when I was engaged in political organizing in the San Francisco Bay Area. As a diaspora Hawaiian, I was taught that it is ethically fundamental to support the indigenous peoples of the land I'm on and to make sure not to overshadow those struggles, especially when lifting up Hawaiian sovereignty. In any case, it is also worth noting that where I'm speaking to you from today, New England as a broader region has a very long and violent history of settler colonial erasure, too often making it a challenge to even learn who the people of the land are in any given place, especially in the numerous specific contexts in which said nations do not have federal recognition and typically have no treaty with the United States. And it is also important to note that both the treaty making and federal recognition processes are quite different on this side of the medicine line, also known as the US Canadian border. Indeed, knowing whose lands one is occupying is a prerequisite to mobilizing beyond land acknowledgements. And I've taken up some of this work in a service learning project here at Wesleyan University called Decolonizing Indigenous Middletown. So to get into my presentation, you heard in the introduction, the bio that was read, uh, that I'm finishing up a book manuscript right now on what I'm terming in Indigenous Implications, Decolonizing US-Palestine Solidarity Politics. My talk today is actually linked to a different new book project, something that is both new and old, something that I uh, can trace back to even my undergraduate senior capstone project, dealt with some of the themes that I'll be uh, putting on the table today. And I feel like I've come full circle over three decades later to revisit these questions in a more concerted way. And uh, that leads me to the new book project that I will be sharing with you now. So the title again, Hawaiian Decolonization and the Enduring Question of Feminism. In 2006, I co-organized a double panel called Native Feminisms Without Apology for the annual meeting of the American Studies Association, which was held in Oakland, California that year. I had invited Professor Aileen Morton Robinson, a Gurumpul woman indigenous to Stradbroke Island in Australia, 
I had invited her to take part in the session as a discussant. It was an exciting time with eight other Indigenous women taking part, and there had been never been any session like this at the ASA conference before. At the end of the second session, when it came time for Morton Robinson to respond, she stated very matter-of-factly that feminism is a Western political philosophy. We were all astounded. Here we had just showcased the diversity of Native feminisms from Navajo, Mohawk, Seneca, Ho-Chunk, Muscogee, Kanaka Maoli, Lenape, and Tanana Athabascan perspectives. The co-organizer of the session, a white woman posing as Cherokee, who was later exposed as a fraud, kept insisting that indigenous women had been feminists for over 500 years, citing their resistance since Columbus entered the so-called New World. In turn, Morton Robinson pointed out that women's resistance to colonization is not one and the same as feminism. Together, we all contested Morton Robinson's claims, countering it with more examples of indigenous feminism, along with Black American, Chicana, Puerto Rican, and other examples from the global South, known as third world feminism, all to try and make the case that feminism is not Western. But she smiled and shook her head. She shook her head no. This encounter shook me, and I have reflected on it now for well over a decade. I share this story with you because it was pivotal to my own intellectual and political development as an indigenous woman activist scholar who has long struggled to identify or who had long struggled to identify and produce what might be considered Hawaiian feminism in praxis and or knowledge production. My talk today addresses the politics of contemporary Kanaka Maoli women's national nationalist activism and the reclamation of Manawahine, women's power. This work is related to my next book project, which I'm in the midst of researching and writing now and will outline here. It is provisionally titled, A Question of Decolonization, Hawaiian Women and the Dilemma of Feminism. In the work, I take up a decolonizing methodology, privileging indigenous agency and sovereignty to explore Native Hawaiian women's nationalist activism and its complicated relationship to feminism. I write from my position as both an academic and an activist who has been affiliated with the Hawaiian struggle for nearly, actually for over 30 years now, from my position as an off-island Hawaiian with, a, with strong genealogical and family ties to the islands. And I should note if there are any Kanaka on the webinar listening in, if you wanna know besides my surname, which is the big giveaway of my genealogy, um, my closest kin hail from Anahola, Hawaiian homelands on the island of Kauai, but we have ties all over the archipelago known as Kapai Aina o Hawaii. My grandmothers, um, both I'm Hawaiian on my native, uh, on my father's side and both of my father's parents were native Hawaiian. My grandfather hailed from the island of Molokai and my grandmother's, um, my grandmother's side, her mother's whole line hails from Maui and then we trace back to Moku Okeave, also known as Hawaii or the Big Island. I should also note that when I refer to the Hawaiian nationalist movement, I'm including two opposing political projects, Hawaiian self-determination within US federal policy for Native Americans and Hawaiian independence from the United States based on international law. I focus on the construction and deployment of cultural discourses of reclamation in the area of gender and sexuality within these nationalist projects. These are politicized cultural milieu uh, that, in, that um, entail reconstruction, selective reconstruction, concerned with assessing and accessing sources of knowledge about identities, roles, and relationships that are considered part of an indigenous tradition. In short, the book project theorizes how feminism poses an epistemological problem for indigenous Hawaiian sovereignty. And that takes me back to Morton Robinson's point and my own shift in position in relation to what she advanced on that panel. Back then, when she said feminism was Western, what I heard was white. And that was disorienting to me because I came to learn about feminism through theories produced by indigenous women and women of color. I recall my first exposure to feminist theory in 1987. I was just one year out of high school 
studying in community college and working to transfer to a university. There at Irvine Valley College, Richard Prostowski, a progressive Ashkenazi Jewish professor who is a Shakespearean scholar fresh from getting his doctorate at University of California, Irvine, quickly became one of my first mentors and introduced me to the works of Gloria Ansaldua, Angela Davis, Sheree Moraga, Bell Hooks, and Paula Giddings, just to name a few. In Prostowski's writing composition class, I, I read Borderlands, La Frontera, Women, Race and Class, Loving in the War Years, Ain't I a Woman, and When and Where I Enter. Those works in turn led me to This Bridge Called My Back, Radical Writings by Women of Color. I mark my own trajectory of contact with these authors and their works in order to point out that I never understood feminism to be a haole, as we'd say in Hawaiian, or a white thing, in this case, a white woman's thing. However, it was unclear to me whether it was a Hawaiian thing. By 1989, I had transferred to UC Berkeley as a philosophy major, but swiftly changed to women's studies. And in that department, and also in ethnic studies, I had the privilege of studying with Paula Gunn Allen and Barbara Christian, eventually also June Jordan and Trin T. Minha. And after graduation, I took a year long creative writing workshop with Sheree Moraga in San Francisco. While a student, I learned about the specificity of various women of color feminisms and wondered where the indigenous Hawaiian women or any indigenous Pacific Islander women were. For my senior capstone as an undergrad, I researched the activism of Kanaka Mali women in the sovereignty movement and tried earnestly to find any native Hawaiian articulations of feminism as I imagined them at the time. One of the first pieces I found was a 1984 essay by Haunani K. Trask titled, Fighting the Battle of Double Colonization, The View of a Hawaiian Feminist. In it, she described the difficulties she faced as an activist woman in the Hawaiian nationalist political movement. Her analysis was rooted in her own experiences with the grassroots organization, Protect Koho'olawe Ohana, formed in 1976 to stop the US Navy's use of the island of Koho'olawe for bombardment training. Trask do broad, broader connections to feminist theory and the relationship between feminist and nationalist struggles for political praxis. She concluded that indigenous women must fight for their own liberation as women while they fight for the liberation of their people as a whole. Although I could see then see that Trask's analysis had a number of limitations due to a reliance on white radical feminists to launch a critique of the Hawaiian case, her essay, her essay resonated for me at the time. I had already read extensively about how nationalist struggles the world over had historically emphasized the masculine struggle for liberation, movements in which men relegated women to behind the scenes labor while they took the leadership positions, the credit, and the media attention. In those cases, women, excuse me, in those cases, men of color argued that they were countering white racism by asserting patriarchal authority within their own communities. And in those nationalist struggles, oppressed peoples of all genders were fighting patriarchal colonial power, while women in those societies and other who are feminized were additionally challenging white women's racism as well as male domination from their own cultural contexts. This is where third world and women of color feminisms come from. Anyhow, back to my trajectory and search for Hawaiian feminism. Next, I found Trask's first book titled Eros and Power, The Promise of Feminist Theory from 1986, in which she offered a sustained critique of Western civilization using radical feminist theory to launch a Marxist critique of the nature of social organization and the deployment of economic and political power. Although Trask made it clear that it was an analysis of Western patriarchal culture, she relied almost exclusively on the works of white American feminist theorists. Her discussion of women of color, which did not include indigenous women at all, let alone Hawaiian women, can be found in the afterword of the book, a three-page section on race that points to the works to works by Audre Lorde, Sheree Moraga, and Angela Davis. 
but nowhere did she reckon with their contributions to feminist knowledge, production, their theories and activism. Had she taken their intellectual contributions and political interventions seriously, Trask may have had a different understanding of what today we would term intersectional feminism, especially as they each theorized race, gender, and class, and for Lord and Moraga, sexuality as well. By 1992, however, Trask changed tack and did a 180. Her second book, titled From a Native Daughter, included an essay, Pacific Island Women and White Feminism, which advanced her critique of the Western individualism promoted by white American feminism. She, served, she argued that it served to undermine Hawaiian collective struggles for self-determination and that race and culture served as more salient forces of oppression for Hawaiian women than sex or gender. Importantly though, the context for her critique was a history of failed alliance work with white feminists in Hawaii who refused to see how Hawaiian women's issues such as control over our bodies are inextricably linked to American settler colonialism. She explains, quote, in Hawaii, they see the oppression of women, but they refuse to see the oppression of Hawaiian women as a product of colonialism, end quote. Implicit in Trask's critique is the demand that white women mark their own racial position, as well as interrogate their assumptions as to what constitutes feminism. She questions why Hawaiian women should be forced to see quote, land and sovereignty as clearly secondary to so-called women's issues, end quote. Indeed, she asks, but why is land our mother, not a women's issue? Several years later in 1996, Trask would write a piece titled Feminism and Indigenous Hawaiian Nationalism for the journal Signs. Trask explained that once she returned home to Hawaii from the continental United States for schooling, she imagined a linking of feminism with indigenous nationalism. But as she explains, quote, the political and cultural environment splintered my acquired feminism from my Hawaiian existence, end quote. She further reasoned, quote, any exclusive focus on women neglected the historical oppression of all Hawaiians and the large force field of imperialism, end quote. But she also specifically characterized all white American feminism as separatist and charged that white American feminist women are loyal to the US state because they're American by nationality. Unfortunately, here she conceded that feminism entails an exclusive focus on women or advanced, excuse me, the notion that feminism entails an exclusive focus on women at the expense of attending to history of Hawaiian oppression through US imperialism. Rather than critique the terms of feminism she had employed and retool them, Trask surmised, quote, there were simply too many limitations in the scope of feminist theory and practice, end quote, as though she herself did not have the right to tend to the limitations by re-theorizing what a feminist theory and practice would need to embody in the cultural context of her homeland in order for it to not splinter her from her Hawaiian existence. Trask argues that the ideological and political investment of rights obscures American colonialism and the suppression of native Hawaiian cultural practices as alternatives to the cultural rights model of incorporation. As she put it, quote, sovereignty for our people is a larger goal than legal or educational or political equality without men, end quote. In any case, after recalling her return to Hawaii from college, she declared, quote, now while I am always an advocate of women's power and claims. My context is Hawaiian and not American culture. And my political work is based on Hawaiian self-determination. This focus includes all our people, not only our women. Traditional women's issues, reproductive rights, equal employment, domestic violence, are obviously part of the struggle for our homelands and our integrity as an indigenous nation." End quote. While Trask did not detail what women's power and claims look like, she does mention what she considers traditional women's issues and goes on to say that sovereignty is the main issue and that indigenous women in struggle 
fashion indigenous-based views of what constitutes women's concerns. In conclusion, she argues that the answers to the specifics of women's oppression reside in the Hawaiian people's collective achievement of the larger goals of self-government and not in a feminist agenda. Ultimately, Trask condemned feminism writ large as something howly, also known as foreign or white, within the limitations of a specifically white cultural feminism that went unmarked as such. In the end, she declared feminism as a quote, unwanted gift of Americanism. Trask's assessment of feminism as white neglects the fact that US women's, the US women's movement had its origins in the anti-slavery movement. Both black and white American women developed women's rights platforms as an outgrowth of their respective work in abolitionist struggles. Furthermore, as white women advocated for the liberation of enslaved people of African descent, they began to question their own status and the limitations they faced both legally and culturally as citizens. In envisioning model alternatives, many turned to the Haudenosaunee, also known as the Iroquois Confederacy, for inspiration. These white women noticed that the indigenous women of those tribal nations on whose homelands they resided, in the case of many who participated in the Seneca Falls Convention, for example, were exercising political and interpersonal agency in their extended families and partnerships with regard to cultural authority, land, leadership, and motherhood. And this I'm drawing on Sally Wagner's book work here. And I think this is what may be termed or might be termed the red roots of feminism, which is uh, something that Laguna uh, Pueblo scholar Polygon Allen uh, used to describe other white American feminist struggles uh, later in the 19th century. A fierce disagreement though about whether or not to support the 15th amendment uh, to the US constitution, which granted African American men the right to vote led to a division in the American women's rights movement. In 1869, activists established two competing nationalists, excuse me, national organizations focused on winning woman suffrage. The National Women Suffrage Association, known as the NWSA, opposed the 15th Amendment, while the American Woman Suffrage Association, the AWSA, supported the new law. The erasure of the Haudenosaunee in accounts of the splits between white and black women may be because of the focus on struggling for the vote by suffragists who did not problematize US citizenship itself. Whereas historically and continuing today, the Haudenosaunee have categorically rejected it. These political splits expose the late 19th century examples of the distinction between civil rights and sovereignty. In any case, however, despite the fact that the origins of feminism in the United States cannot be fairly described as white or not merely white, Trask's political critique of feminism as American is framed as both a cultural and political problem, which still deserves serious consideration. In my book project, I explore the reasons why feminist assertions within the Hawaiian nationalist movement are silenced by people of all genders as redundant. I have found the notion of feminism as not seen as irreconcilable with Hawaiian cultural norms. Instead, it is typically viewed as unnecessary and superfluous since Kanaka Mali typically regard patriarchal norms as a colonial import. This popular understanding is critical to the current nationalist context where the movement as a whole encourages a rethinking of the Hawaiian past as a basis for cultural reclamation projects, all in the service of political mobilization. We know from the works by Jocelyn Linekin, Caroline Ralston, Lili Kala Kamealehiva, and Noe Noe Silva, that in the pre-colonial period, gender was also not a standalone category since all gender roles were mediated by genealogical rank. It was a gender egalitarian society but that was within respective genealogical ranks. Hawaiian kinship was and still is bilaterally reckoned through both the maternal and paternal lines. 
Furthermore, Hawaiian women held governing positions as paramount chiefs and lesser chiefs prior to the formation of the monarchy in the late 18th century. In other words, they held high status positions in their own right. And due to the pathbreaking work of Kanaka Maoli scholars who have been at the forefront of Hawaiian language research, like Kama'alehiva and Silva, among many others, and there's a new growing generation I want to acknowledge, uh, comprising a whole nother wave of the decolonization of the Hawaiian archive. We know even more about pre-colonial as well as late 18th and early 19th century Hawaiian society. Their research examining traditional chants, songs, and prayers has meant an ongoing restoration of female deities to their place in the Hawaiian cosmogony. Historically, we know that Hawaiian women have been closely associated with land and valued as producers of high cultural goods. They held a separate domain of female uh, ritual and social realms, were recognized as autonomous beings, and were the points of access to rank land and political power for men. And what is clear when listening to contemporary Kanakamali activists is that they claim female gods as ancestors who inspire them in their roles as strong female leaders today. Notice that I use the term female gods rather than using the term goddess or goddesses. Uh, in the Hawaiian context, goddess would be a misnomer because it already presumes that a deity is male. And so you have to add the ESS on the end of it to feminize it. Uh, we had uh, in, the, in the historical record and today, uh, we know that gods can be of any gender as um, can chiefs. It was the process of colonialism that transformed the Hawaiian system of pono, balance. As works by Patricia Grimshaw, Judith Gething, and Sally Mary document, Calvinist Christians introduced Western ideas to Hawaiian society, which dictated the domestic subjugation of women in social, political, and economic realms. As Linekin argues in her book, Sacred Queens and Women of Consequence, the position of Hawaiian women on the whole seemed to shift where through processes of US colonization, non-Hawaiian men became points of economic access and status for indigenous Hawaiian women by the mid 1840s. Hawaiian elites of all genders manifested male prominence in the Western political structure of the Hawaiian kingdom, which eventually degraded women's status legally. However, issues of genealogical rank determined uh, Hawaiian women's status in ways where gender subordination was not always clear cut. And here I wanna acknowledge uh, the contradiction between women's legal standing and the actual political power of high ranking female chiefs during the 19th century. The con consolidation of governance threatened Hawaiian women's status within various ranks, but, but did not succeed in entirely changing traditional practices or customary practices where they were able to assert their agency. And that's why we have this lineage still that's still robust and that people are drawing on selectively today. This was also true regarding women standing within rural communities of the common people known as the maka ainana, the eyes of the land. Still, Christian missionization and broader colonial onslaught undeniably transformed this system of gender egalitarianism subordinating Hawaiian women through the introduction of marriage, or rather the imposition of marriage, and other state-based forms of sexual regulation, considerably demoting their status by the time of the US-backed overthrow of the kingdom in 1893. Nonetheless, Native Hawaiian women played a formative role in confronting US imperialism at the turn of the century, including organizing mass opposition to the US annexation of 1898. And I would, um, I mentioned uh, Noe Noe Silva's work earlier. This incredible uh, documentation of Hawaiian resistance to US annexation can be found in her book, Aloha Betrayed. And the subtitle is Native Hawaiian Resistance to US Colonialism. By 1900, the Organic Act, which organized the Hawaiian Islands into a colonial territory, unilaterally conferred citizenship on Native Hawaiians with men given the right to vote. Hawaiian women did not gain the US franchise until 1920, 
Now, while US citizenship is contested among many Hawaiians today, and when I'm saying Hawaiians, I mean indigenous Hawaiians, it's contested, especially in the context of the contemporary national struggle to re restore kingdom sovereignty. History shows that native Hawaiian men took advantage of these early 20th century forms of empowerment that excluded women. For example, they dominated the territorial legislature throughout the early 1900s over non-Hawaiian men, including white and Asian. As Rumi Yasutake documents, elite Hawaiian women organized to secure the US franchise. Three of the leaders of the national women's suffrage, excuse me, three of the leaders in the National Women's Equal Suffrage Association of Hawaii were of high ranking indigenous chiefly lineage. Wilhelmina Kekela O Kala, excuse me, Kalana Nui, Wademan Dowsett, Emma Ahuena Davidson Taylor, and Emma Navahi. Dowsett helped organize the National Women's Equal Suffrage Association of Hawaii, the first women's suffrage organization in the territory of Hawaii in 1912. She actively campaigned for the rights of local women to vote prior to the passage of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution in 1920. Dowsett was the president of the association and its constitution was modeled after the National Woman Suffrage Association. She worked closely with Taylor and Navahi, the initial leaders of this movement. Taylor was a cultural historian and genealogist involved in local philanthropic, historical, and civil group, civic groups. And we know from Silva's work that Navahi was a prominent leader in the anti-annexation movement of the 1890s. These women worked for the US vote despite their prior opposition to becoming US citizens and fighting for the survival of the kingdom as an independent state. But rather than understanding their fight for enfranchisement as a shift in their national identity, it seems they were working to assert their agency on behalf of the Hawaiian people at large. Indeed, they were embattled with white women missionary descendants who did not want to see the demographic of Kanakamali voters double and potentially threaten their entrenched white power. These Hawaiian women organized for the franchise, contributing to the Hawaiian Independent Party, later renamed the Independent Home Rule Party, which was a political party active in the islands from 1900 to 1912. The decline of the party was tied to Republican domination in the islands. Jumping ahead to the historical, in the historical chronology, through the territorial era, and that ranges from 1900 to 1959, when the US classified and ruled Hawaii as a US colony, those decades entailed coercive forms of biocultural assimilation imposed by the territorial and federal governments. This included a 50% blood quantum rule devised in 1921 and still used today by the 50th state of Hawaii and the US federal government to define how, who counts as a native Hawaiian with a lowercase n for native. If you have any questions, maybe we can tend to that after the talk. Soon after 1959 statehood in the late 1960s and 1970s, the Hawaiian community experienced a cultural renaissance, one that became politicized as a nationalist movement by the late 1970s and 1980s. However, the work on gender during this period is very thin and there remains a paucity of work constituting a body of Hawaiian feminist thought, which is one of the developments or lack thereof that I seek to understand. For my book project, I'm interviewing those who were active in the Hawaiian sovereignty movement in the 1980s and 90s, prior to 1998. And I can talk up in the Q&A if people are interested about what, why that cutoff date, if you will, which has to do with the changing terrain of the nationalist movement as a whole in legal terms. And those interviews include both leaders as well as rank and file members of various sovereignty organizations. And I'm asking them about the dynamics of Hawaiian women's political labor in these contexts with regard to gender relations with Kanaka Maoli men during the same period. My aim is to learn how interviewees understood Kanaka Maoli women's roles and responsibilities in relation to the Hawaiian cultural norms and historical precedents of women's leadership and participation in the public sphere. I started conducting interviews exactly a year ago this month when I was, when I was on a trip to three different islands, Maui, Kauai, and Oahu, and managed to meet with a good number of veteran activists who allowed me um, to interview them, including Dana Naomi Hall, 
Lea Nui Nui Nihu, Kyalohikina Sukiyama, my own auntie Puanani um, Rogers, Lynette Cruz, Puanani Burgess, Kuumela Hagomes, Sabra Kauka, Laulani Teal, Lilikala Kama Elihiva, Phyllis Kuchi Kayan, Daviana Polmai Kai McGregor, Nalani Minton, and Kim Kuule Burney. I also had the opportunity to interview three Hawaiian men so far to ask them about Hawaiian women's activist labor, including Pokai Lainui, also known as Hayden Burgess, Makanani Atwood, and Jonathan Kamaka K. Viva Ole, excuse me, Jonathan K. Kamaka Viva Ole Osorio. Although my research trip got cut short due to the COVID-19 pandemic, I've since been able to follow up with a few phone interviews with other activists from that period, including Sharon Wahine Kayu Lumho, Elizabeth Kuipo Pa Martin, Ipo Nihipali, and Kunani Nihipali. I hope to return to the islands to do more interviews in person when it is safe. The book will have four chapters in addition to an introduction and a conclusion. Chapter one situates Native Hawaiian women and the debates on feminism in relation to the activists and scholars producing Native feminist theory between Native American and Native Pacific Islander women, uh, highlighting especially Maori women and theories of Manawahine and the Aotearoa context. In the remaining three chapters, I tend to different case studies. Um, this is where the interviews come in and I am interested in focusing on activists' respective understandings of feminism, women's leadership, and the politics of tradition. If the pattern is, women, is of women of color developing their own feminist agendas uh, due to male dominance in their respective struggles for self-determination, right? That's historically what we see in third world feminism and women of color feminism, that the feminist uh, articulation comes out of those struggles within the broader um, political movement for self-determination and decolonization. And Hawaiian women did not produce a body of Hawaiian feminist thought in relation to the modern Hawaiian mo movement of the late 20th century. I'm asking what might that tell us in terms of leadership in that period? From my interviews thus far, there was only one woman who said that she felt held back in terms of um, her leadership uh, role because of her gender. And um, so I'm interested in what the split looks like in terms of women taking their position within the movement during that era. And the last chapter of the book will focus on the work of Haunani K. Trask, tracing her political trajectory, um, drawing on what I've presented earlier today uh, tracking from her strong identification as a feminist in the 1980s and her shift in the 1990s when she dis disidentified entirely. This is an expansion of what I have presented. In short, or this will be an ex expansion of what I've presented here today. In short, my project argues that feminism poses an epistemological problem for Hawaiian sovereignty and women's reclamation of manawahine. Feminism of whatever diverse stripe or color is fundamentally about a break with patriarchal tradition. Looking back at my lessons as a women's studies undergraduate major, I returned to Mary Wollstonecraft's 1792 texts, A Vindication of the Rights of Woman with Strictures on Moral and Political Subjects. This is one of the earliest works of feminist literature or philosophy. In it, she responded to the educational and political theorists of the 18th century who wanted to deny women an education. Wollstone, Wollstonecraft asserted that rights should not be based on tradition. Rights, she argued, should be conferred because they're reasonable and just regardless of their basis in tradition. As I conclude here, I wanna to return to Morton Robinson's assertion in the story I opened up with that feminism is always already Western, its very origins in the Western rights discourse of liberal feminism. Recently, Morton Robinson argued in the 20th anniversary re-release of her book, Talking Up to the White Woman, to claim to be a feminist as an indigenous woman discursively places one within the logics of a white Western feminist paradigm, one born of the enlightenment that functions within the presuppositions of Western patriarchal thought. As she put it, quote, 
in order to transcend the female body, to claim being a person of reason, white Western feminism embraced the very white patriarchal system of thought that created the mind, body, earth split. To counter white patriarchy's construction of white woman's nature as irrational, emotional, and captives of biology, they identified as persons of reasons, reason disconnected from Earth Mother who sustains us all, end quote. I build on Morton Robinson's work to theorize how indigenous Hawaiian womanhood, manoahine, is not presupposed as human-centered or disconnected from Earth. Instead, it is substantiated by what Hawaiians call ea, which we use as a shorthand or gloss for indigenous sovereignty. And I'm keeping the scare quotes around the S word there. Ea is embodied and grounded within complex relations and between myriad, among and between myriad deities, humans, ancestral beings, the land, and all of the natural world. As Noelani Goodyear Ka'opua points out, quote, one can use the same word to indicate life and sovereignty, ea. The two are crucial to one another, end quote. Hawaiian women continue to identify and mobilize around indigenous models of liberation that draw on a radical difference from Western societies. Ours are based on non-proprietary relationships to land and other living entities. Thus, the modality is arguably about a selective return, not break with tradition, but a selective return to tradition, a project of restoration based on our own epistemological resources, ethics, values, and principles for a renewed sense of possibility. Mahalo. Thank you. Wow. That was amazing. <laughs> Thank you uh, so much for that. Um, I know uh, Elaine is very excited to delve into some Q&As, but before I, I, I push it back over to her to start us off, uh, if there's anybody who's watching um, that wants to engage with any of this or have questions, uh, please feel free to use the, uh, the Q&A function um, and then we'll definitely pose those um, back. And so uh, thank you so much for that uh, amazing talk. I was feverishly writing notes through the entire thing with <laughs> lots of lots of different kind of things that came to me uh, within my own work and research. And uh, and so uh, we're, we're very appreciative to uh, have you speak with us today. I'm going to pass it over to Elaine to, uh, to start us off. Thank you. Yeah, I just, uh, yeah, I, as I wrote in the chat, like, just thank you for such a rich, historically informed exploration of the complex and changing relationships among feminisms, Hawaiian nationalisms, Hawaiian women's political labor, and settler colonialisms all the way up through to the 1980s. I'm hugely interested to read this book, which extends the analysis to Maori feminisms and women and Aotearoa, Trask's own shifting relationships to feminisms, these alternative and intertwining intellectual genealogies of Indigenous women and their struggles. Uh, uh, amazing. <laughs> so, so I'm just uh, super excited and super stimulated. Um, if I had a, a question, it would be uh, maybe about your own practices. So here we are, um, you know, often working, if, if for those who are Indigenous, I'm not Indigenous, but for those who are working, you know, often working not on their, our own Indigenous lands or people like me who are settlers, and how do we live through some of what you talked about in the very, you know, this is an unfair question because it, it shifts a bit from your, your talk, but how do we live some of what you talked and these relationships, um, these very profound relationships of responsibility to the land um, and, and women's relationships, you know, to land and to water, of course, as well in, in, um, in Hawaii and riverways. And uh, how do we live that out in, in the institutions that we're in as scholars? You know, is this just a disconnect? Is this, how do we navigate, um, how do we navigate those complications? Is there anything that you have uh, changed in your own practice as a Hawaiian woman in the academy, you know, through your in, in, in kind of reflections with these women as you do these new uh, kind of oral histories. That's a lot, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I really appreciate the question because I think we can, regardless of the Hawaiian context, I think we need to ask that question. All of us need to ask that question about, you know, what are we doing in these institutions and also how do we, you know, negotiate 
our uh, predicaments and the structural constraints and the contradictions we live with as we try to actually advance decolonization uh, and land-based and water-based practices. And for me, you know, my answer has to also acknowledge the diaspora piece because I am here on Wayne Gunk territory and really trying to do some of the work to actually um, work against the erasure of Wangunk people and working with uh, Wangunk elders who the, the dominant, uh, the, the official doctrine here is that there are no Wangunk left, They're, they don't exist. And that's just not true. It took me years actually to find out um, that there was actually a living Wangunk community here. So for me, first and foremost, being attentive to place is what does that mean in relation to this land that I'm on and the waters here. I'm literally a mile and a half from the Connecticut River, for example, and I'm roughly 30 minutes from the Long Island Sound, which is another waterway and not that far from the Atlantic Ocean. So just want to orient myself to this particular, ge set, you know, this geographical um, location. But for me, in terms of thinking about the Hawaiian piece, you know, I think that this is a question about what does decolonization mean in a settler colonial context, whether it's here in Connecticut or in Hawaii. And for me, that's about challenging non-consensual forms of domination in, in every way that they manifest. So that's, you know, to really take a stand against militarization, uh, the environmental degradation of our homeland, and the ways in which the tourist economy contributes to the breach of the care of those lands. And I'm not back home in the islands doing that land-based work. There are incredible people doing that hard work of restoring the taro beds, pulling out invasive species, teaching people how to plant again. And it's an indigenous centered practice, but it's all inclusive. Everybody's welcome and everybody eats. And hopefully everybody eats a lot, you know? So there's something there that is really important that's about being grounded in place. And I wanna acknowledge that th that's the work that's happening back home, that I'm, I'm 5,000 miles from where that action is. But in terms of thinking about my own participation in the movement as a daughter of the diaspora, if you will, you know, people will say, well, how can you take part in this so far from Hawaii? And I say, well, far from Hawaii is one thing, but I'm quite close to Washington, DC. Right. Or when I was in California, you know, it's it's a much easier trip to Hawaii. And what does it mean to actually raise awareness about the Hawaiian struggle on the continent and beyond the Americas? You know, what does it mean to actually present what the Hawaiian case looks like when I'm a guest in Palestine? Right. And to really look at the structural similarities between where occupation and settler colonialism meet. Right. And you know, what that looks like in doing some comparative work on Hawaii and pa Palestine. In the interpersonal um, part, you know, this is where it gets more into an individual mode, but I mean, I've, I've been very outspoken about um, the state of Hawaii's co-optation of the twisted notion of aloha to try and promote same-sex marriage and really, you know, tracking the colonial imposition of marriage and that you can, you can open it up and make it more inclusive but uh, I'm not interested in that project. I'm interested in decolonization. And to me, decolonization is a practice. And so that takes place on the ground in terms of countering forms of colonial domination as much as possible every way we can. But understanding, of course, the structural constraints. We're not outside of the structure. So I'm not trying to like, grasp for some pure kind of modality here. And I, I did note, uh, when you introduced me, you know, talking about sort of refusing the romanticization. And, you know, if anyone thinks I'm romanticizing, just take a look at my second book. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a really, um, it's a really pretty thorough and hard hitting critique of the ways in which male dominance and heterosexism and proprietary notions between gender and sexuality as well as over land have permeated some of our national struggles. And so, you know, to me, Decolonization extends into the interpersonal realm in terms of how we conduct our conjugal lives, as you will. You know, to me, I'm in, I, I'm interested in the fact that I don't have to dream up so many alternatives. Although there's nothing wrong with that. If it doesn't exist, let's let's dream it up. You know, I don't need a precedent, but if I've got one, you know, I have a precedent for what I, I affectionately term pre-colonial polyamory. 
I don't have to pull that out of a hat. There, that existed, you know, of course I'm using a 21st century lingo to talk about it, but there is something different in a society where bisexual orientation was pretty normative and where people of all genders could have multiple partners and all ranks, not just men having, you know, a, a grass hut with a lot of women waiting for some dude to come back, right? Conjugal autonomy, that, that women could end relationships. And that included common women, you know? Somebody comes back from that fishing trip, if they see their little knapsack outside the hut, they gotta hit, they gotta hit the road. So to me, you know, that, that to me provides what I mean about epistemological resources, that there's an ethics there that one can call from and the example that I like to give when I'm trying to break this down for audiences that aren't as familiar with the Hawaiian case would be the, you know, the concept of punalua, for example, or po'olua, excuse me, there's punalua and there's po'olua. So in, in, the, in the days of old, if a Hawaiian woman gave birth to a child and there were two potential um, biological fathers of that child or biological parents of that child, and they weren't sure about the paternity, both men were responsible for that child. That's very different than Western society. That's very different from most societies I'm aware of, um, right? And then people would say, yeah, but you can just get a DNA test today. You know, what do you want about? And I think, well, that's not really my point. My point is that there's no such thing as this perverse notion of an illegitimate child, number one but it also means that child and the mother of that child or the parent of that child will not be punished because somebody's not reckoning with paternity. But then again, it goes back to bilateral genealogical kinship. It's not like everything hinges on male recognition of paternity and like it does in Western society, for example, and in many Eastern societies, right? So, I mean, that's the other thing is, is you've got these dominant models. So to me, yes, you can go get a DNA test. That's not the point. What I'm saying is what are the ethics that we can draw on that? What are the lessons? For me, that can be pedagogical in thinking about uh, autonomy, but within the broader context of responsibility and community care, if you will. And I would also just add one other piece to that is that, you know, I don't want to, um, I wanna make sure to be very explicit that for me, the project of decolonization in a US context and in a Canadian context, I think it's essential that that is happening in tandem with the abolition struggle and to challenge anti-black racism and the continuous devaluation of black lives and abolition, not just of defund the police, although I support that, but abolition in all its forms. And to me, that's the bedrock for the US society around um, the settler colonial piece, right? And tending to it through decolonization and the enslavement piece and tending to it through abolition. And so I wanted to also acknowledge that as part of my social location here. Yeah, just amazing. One thing I wish I had said actually in the introduction listening to you now is in, is in that, like, I think it's a quality of I think it's a quality of excellent writing and I think of an into a kind of a, a form of intellectual imagination which is valuable when people are able to move in this way from the big historical picture into kind of the intimacy of everyday life and what are our responsibilities to one another. And I will say if anyone in who's listening is not familiar with your work is, uh, you know, I, the first thing I read by you was, you know, starts with the savage kiss and what is the savage kiss right and and it, and, and, it, and it starts from from this question and this kind of you know what sounds small and goes into this exploration of you know colonialism hawaiian nationalism gender sexuality and i i do think that's a i think it's a quality of a brilliant mind and not everybody can do it and you can do it and i think you just showed it in the answer and it's true in your book so anyone who's here and doesn't read your work i just hope i i i hope this is an incentive to go read it <laughs> um, well if land sex and anarchy as the keywords don't grab you <laughs> exactly. I, don't, I don't have anything else that's that's all i got <laughs> it's, as i say it's a pretty good trio it's a pretty good trio maybe it's a menage a trois i don't know but anyway uh sean do you have uh, <laughs> do you have a do you have a question or observation so i'm just noting uh somebody saying hello for uh, pablo is saying hello from puerto rico and any comments reflections around how statehood status impacts differently the struggles facing native hawaiian women versus native women in other u.s colonies um so america's uh, samoa guam 
um, for as examples and what similarities these countries still have with Hawaiian struggles? Oh, what a great question. Thank you so much. Um, buenos dias. Um, you know, I'm really interested in that question as well and looking at the colonial status. So for audiences who um, aren't aware of the, that colonial history, uh, can definitely um, take a look at the, the chat box or the Q&A box, right? So Guam, the Northern Mariana Islands, American Samoa, and we can add Puerto Rico as well as the US Virgin Islands in there. I think that the settler colonial piece is really important as well as the military piece. For example, I don't consider all of those island colonies sites of settler colonial violence. For example, the U.S. Virgin Islands is a settler is a colony of the U.S., but I wouldn't characterize it as settler colonial. Um, as same with American Samoa, I would not characterize it as, as settler colonial in the sense that it's a colony and it's American Samoa, for example, is subject to U.S. imperialism. The Navy uses it as a station, and it's definitely bound by a particular form of U.S. federalism. But if I'm, I'm going to work here with Patrick Wolf's definition of settler colonialism as a project that's land centered, American Samoans still are well over 90% of the population and hold over 90% of their land in traditional land tenure. You don't see um, the US government flooding it with, with American settlers who are non Samoans to try and take their land and eliminate them, right? And that's where you get that logic of elimination of the native, as he puts it. That doesn't mean that it's not subject to imperialism and another form of colonialism. So for me, the political status questions are distinct. There's the military piece there, but that looks quite different when you go to Guam or the Northern Mariana Islands where um, Juliet Nebelon, who's a scholar at Trinity College here in Hartford has theorized settler militarism to really look at that elimination, but through US uh, empire making through militarism. And so I think that the military piece is huge, the settler colonial piece, and I would put also for both Puerto Rico and Hawaii, as well as some of these other sites, the tourism piece is really huge. What does it mean to be priced out of your own land? And then the questions around status are, are interesting, right? I mean, I've, I've paid really close attention to the Puerto Rican political status debates and the sort of temperature checks that the Congress does in these non-binding votes every periodically that they call a plebiscite and non-binding plebiscite and really trying to exclude the diaspora Puerto Rican population because you know historically speaking I don't know if this would still hold today but my understanding is that um, the federal government knows that that there's a very strong pro-independence political position of diaspora Puerto Ricans on the continent and that that's one of the reasons for excluding them from the vote that said, these are non-binding votes in the first in the first place, and you know we have that in the Hawaiian context. How Hawaii came to be the 50th state is through a fraudulent mode, rather than having a UN plebiscite that's overseen by the world community. The colonial administration of the territory conducted an internal vote just months before the decolonization protocols were codified at the United Nations. And those decolonization protocols were crafted for franchise colonies. So, you know, it could be seen as a mismatch. And then for the Hawaiian case, because Hawaii had an independent state, that sets it apart in terms of the legal genealogy from all of the other colonies. I'm not saying that to degrade the sovereignty of the people of those other islands, but that there's a different legal and historical genealogy when one has had an actual independent state that's been occupied. So with Hawaii, it's this real hybrid model between occupation, settler colonialism, imperialism, and now 50th statehood of Hawaii. So the gender, for me, the gender questions in those sites, you know, I think really are context specific in thinking about militarization, settler militarism, settler colonialism, tourism, amongst other, other axes of domination and oppression. Thank you for that. Um, I actually want to go back. So one of my my so one of my interests, I think, and uh, what I hear a lot from students I teach around Indigenous health, Indigenous sexuality, and and, and I I see or I hear from a lot of uh, especially urban Indigenous youth 
who are experiencing a great deal of gender fluidity, you know, defining two spiritness, um, you know, queerness and and the aspects and how that relates to colonization and the impacts that that has and, and that navigation. I'm just getting your thoughts and throwing that out there for you on any any thoughts because I know some of there are there are a couple of students that were kind of like oh how, how do we ask this and so I'm just going to throw that out there for you uh, on their behalf. Great thank you so much yeah I mean notice when I talked about genders and access I said all genders I didn't say both genders and that's because in the Hawaiian context we have more than two and there is the third category called mahu and Mahu has the glottal, uh, excuse me, the uh, Macron over the A and the U, so M-A-H-U. And um, there's still a lot more work to be done on that. I will, I, I wanna mention a really exciting research that's gonna be published soon by Jamaica Osorio on female Mahu or those feminized um, as Mahu. But Mahu is a category that and the reason I'm mentioning the new research is that it's going to be the Hawaiian language scholars that really cut to that because so much of that has been um, erased from the historical record. And it's those who are fluent in Hawaiian language and can read 19th century Hawaiian language in Hawaiian language newspapers, for example. There were over 70 Hawaiian language newspapers at the time of the U.S. overthrow in, in full effect. And after the U.S. Um, converted Hawaiian to U.S. colony, uh, you know, the ban of Hawaiian language as a medium of instruction stayed on the books until the 1980s. Now, I mentioned, just to back up a minute, I mentioned the overthrow in 1893, and I mentioned the unilateral annexation in 1898 and the Organic Act of 1900. What I left out of that chronology is that after the overthrow, which was orchestrated by 13 white men with U.S. Marines backing them to overthrow Queen Liliuokalani, they moved to have the US annex Hawaii right away. But it was right in the transition, it was January 17th, 1893, and it was the transition from uh, President Harrison to Grover Cleveland. And Grover Cleveland slowed everything down and sent investigators to the islands to check out what had happened and slowed everything down and said, I'm not gonna annex Hawaii, we need to find out what happened. And after the investigation, Cleveland said, Hawaii, the queen deserves to be restored. And this was an unlawful act of war, but he never carried through what it meant to restore the queen to the throne and to re-recognize Hawaiian national sovereignty under international law. I mentioned that because once that happened, those who orchestrated the overthrow created their own government in Hawaii. And I left that out of the narration. In 1894, they founded the Republic of Hawaii and the Republic of Hawaii um, banned Hawaiian language as a medium of instruction, but those laws stayed on the books after the U.S. formally annexed later or unilaterally annexed. Um, so you have a huge gap in terms of the record, but those materials are still in the archives and people are going back to look at those materials to try and reconstruct, to understand more about the sexual and gender possibilities, including gender fluidity. The other thing I'll mention about the category of mahu is that today in contemporary cultural spaces, including the urban, but not limited to the urban, and, and in islands, the urban is pretty close to the rural. It's, it's, these are small places. Um, people have also used it for trans liberation. And so, you know, it's been used in ways that are contemporary for other kinds of categories that have maybe cultural antecedents, but are not necessarily trans historical. And so from what I've learned through my limitation in terms of what I'm able to read in the, in the archives as a non-fluent speaker. I understand Mahu as being um, a gender indeterminate cat, like a category for gender indeterminacy or in-betweenness, not necessarily for a trans category, which I understand is something different than say intersex, right? And so, you know, but I'm not trying to police who's using these terms. I'm just trying to point to the variation of what that concept may in include and how people are mobilizing it and claiming it today, ability and liberation and challenging homophobia and transphobia and biphobia and um, male dominance as colonial. And that can be very powerful. Again, if people don't have a tradition to draw on, I don't have a problem
with femi feminism is a great response if you have a tradition, because again, feminism is a break with that tradition. I just think this is moving in a different direction. And this is really about different lineages and genealogies that one can draw on for, for forms of empowerment and liberation. And we do have another question from Patricia Elaine Perkins, who says, thank you for this wonderful talk. I now have a much expanded reading list. Um, and then she asked a question about the relationship between socialist eco-feminists who are typically white and their relationship with indigenous women activists and leaders, and ask if you can talk a little bit more about nothing less than land, land back, property, co property the commons and women, I suppose, in relationship to uh, white eco-feminisms as well as indigenous women activists and leaders. Okay, great. Thank you for the question. Um, you know, I think, I think there's a lot to be said around ecofeminism. And I've had discussions recently with Aileen Morton Robinson about ecofeminism in terms of trying to really reorient towards the natural environment, but there's still this separation between the split that she talked about in the material that I quoted. So I think that's a challenge, right? It's a challenge, it's an epistemological challenge for one, but it also opens up this whole question of how are we gonna live on this planet? How are we gonna reckon with colonial climate catastrophe and understand how to steward, right? And to me, that's again, that the resources are in various places, what it means to survive in, you know, today is a gorgeous sunny day, but in, you know, we had, you know, Arctic freezing temperatures last week. What does it mean to survive here looks different than what does it mean to survive near the volcano on the big island or near Waiale Ale on Kauai, which is one of the wettest spots on earth, right? That the lessons come from the indigenous people of the place who have those original instructions on how to tend to that particular ecosystem. And yet language fails me because to even call it an ecosystem or the natural world is to externalize one to it. And the, as, as far as I can understand, um, that's not how, that's not conceptually part of the frame in a Hawaiian context. There is no separation, right? And so people will say, well, humans and animals. It's like, no, humans are animals. <laughs> so we're talking about non-human animals, right? So just even in the language, we're kind of grope for some of these ways to even have the discussion. So to me, the eco-feminist part, I think, has possibilities for looking at decolonization. That said, I think the socialist part that I heard come out through that question really is still attached to statism. And to me, you know, I don't, you know, I can use international law as a tactic or part of the toolkit to challenge the illegal US hold on Hawaii. The US has, there's no treaty, you know, there's no treaty and you cannot make an unlawful overthrow legal you cannot make a unilateral annexation bilateral, and you cannot make a fraudulent 50th statehood in 1959 legit. It's just, you know, the, the US can't, not through a penny or a puka shell, did they grab Hawaii. And so, you know, I wanna be able to expose the fraud of the US takeover of the Hawaiian kingdom. And I can talk about the independent statehood that Hawaii held prior to that that some would argue is still endures legally today. But that doesn't mean, um, we're just having a discussion about this in the anarchism class that I'm teaching this semester and I'm also teaching a colonialism class. So there's a lot of overlap for me in, in both of those courses. And that's because I'm really talking about challenging state power and US empire and this particular state, the US state as a settler colonial state. But I don't wanna replace this state with another state. I'm not interested in statism because I don't think states in general are the answer to, to any problems. States are part of the problem. And so for me, um, that question of land and land back, that to me is about forming an entirely new social order. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about decolonization, just like I think when we're talking about abolition, right? We're talking about a different world and, and you know, trying to imagine or envision a different way of being and being together, right? So there's that. In terms of property and the commons and women, I have been working on something on the side that I've generated several um, 
presentations and papers out. I don't know if it'll lead to any publications, but I have um, for several years been tracking the leftist discourse of reclaiming the commons and really looking at you know, what the challenge of radical leftist politics, the challenge to not reproduce settler colonial logics and practices. And knowing, and I'm, there's other scholars working on this, and I want to acknowledge Craig Fortier's work, for example, on unsettling the commons as one example, to really bring that to bear on, say, the work of Sylvia Ferreira, who's looked at gender in the commons, and has a nod to indigenous peoples. But to me, it's, there's not a total erasure of indigeneity in that. But to me, reclaiming the commons, it's not a reclaiming. How can you reclaim something that wasn't yours to begin with and was uh, thieved in the first place, right? And looking at some of the work of early Americanists, um, including Taylor Spence, who looks at the making of the US Canadian border in that early period and other early Americanist historians, really looking at this notion of the commons as something that the English brought with them the commons in New England, for example, there's a town green in every New England town. And those are considered the, those were the commons that the settlers took out of expropriated land from indigenous peoples to create their own commons. So the commons already was a settler colonial property claim. And there's a slippage, I think, in some of these. Now, I'm not saying the person who asked the question did this. I'm just saying in political milieu, there's an assumption that the commons is the same as communal land, like a la indigenous communities, and they're not the same. Communal land in Hawaii and all access is very different than after Kamehameha III privatizes Hawaiian land in 1848 and creates the Hawaiian kingdom crown and government land, which essentially are our commons, but it comes out of a propertized uh, genealogy in the first place. So, I mean, I think we have to really think about that at a root level in terms of not conflating commons, the commons with communal land of indigenous peoples and understanding that the commons is not dodging the property claim either. Thank you for that. Um, just noting another question in our Q&A box and uh, we have about seven to eight minutes left before we start wrapping up. Uh, so I'll paraphrase a bit of this, but uh, from Leah, and this is a uh, looking forward to reading your chapter. This is a bit of a methodological question. How do you understand the significance of the one-on-one -on -one interview as part of your project on Mena, uh, Mena Wahai? And can you remind me if you have interviewed, plan to interview Dr. Tresk for the project? If so, how do you plan to engage that interview as part of the chapter on Tresk's shift in thought on feminism and Hawaiian nationalism? Right, um, thank you um, for the question. I am not able to interview um, Dr. Haunani K. Trask. Um, she's actually been sequestered from the public due to health reasons and is indisposed. So at this stage, that's an impossibility. That said, I have studied her work very closely since I, I was an undergrad and I got to meet her in 1990 and we had a really robust ongoing long-term dialogue until she became debilitated to put it um, as, as sensitively as possible. So I am really am reliant on her own papers and her public talks and her interviews, but also soon, I don't know how soon, um, Noelani Goodyear Ka'opua, who I'm quoted at the end of the paper about the concept Ea, she and Erin Kahunavai Wright are writing a biography of Haunani K. Trask. And I'm really excited for that work. I've heard them present selections of it at various conferences. And I think that for me will also be a touchstone in terms of, you know, trying to understand um, that shift and also you know, the rabid um, racism and, and misogyny that, that Hanani K. Trask dealt with in general, but especially in her position in the movement and also at the institution at the University of Hawaii Manoa. But yeah, I, I really am, I won't be able to interview her, unfortunately. I don't know if you want to say any final things before we leave. Um, we just have a, really just a couple of minutes left. I just, I mean, I just thank you for the absolute richness of your talk. I was so looking forward to your coming and I knew, I knew it would be a wonderful and incredibly rich exploration and never easy and always 
kind of interested in the kind of the contradictions and the shifts in these intellectual genealogies that get buried and can be, you know, re-engaged with and not just re-engaged with in any simple way, but, you know, in a really serious way, in a really serious critical way. And, and I just so appreciate your, um, your, your talk and your work. And I'm so grateful to, to, that, that, that you were able to come and, and thank you very much for that. Thank you so much. I've just put my work email address in the chat box. If anybody didn't get to ask a question and might have um, something that nags them later that they want to float by me or, or okay. contact me, I would welcome that. Um, I want to just mention two quick things. One is on March 7th, Cynthia Franklin, who's a professor at the University of Hawaii Manoa that I just mentioned, um, that institution is organizing an event on Hawaiian Palestine in um, frame with several Kanaka Maoli activists in the islands and other people outside of Hawaii, including Dr. Rana Berakat, who I believe is in the audience right now on the call, who will be partaking in that, and Yosef Al-Jamal, and select Palestinian individuals who have gone to Hawaii on solidarity trips. Wow. And, um, bringing that together with Kanaka Maoli activists on the ground who have also many of whom not all have been to Palestine. So that's an event coming up that may interest people. And I can send you details if you email me. And the other thing that I'll leave people with is really keeping an eye on contemporary Hawaiian sovereignty politics today with the Biden administration. So uh, right before Obama left office, the federal government and the state, the 50th state of Hawaii was really pushing the federal recognition model on the Hawaiian people. That's a model that another Trask um, really worked for on the grassroots level, Mililani Trask, to really fight for federal recognition for Native Hawaiians in the 80s through a political project called Kalahui. And that was a grassroots push because Hawaiians are essentially living in like a termination era. And in the 80s, that looked like a very viable and radical option. The movement really shifted in the 90s to a more of a pro-independence and people have, have moved away from federal recognition in the grassroots movement. And that's at the same time that state representatives and people you know, manning state institutions like the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, the Hawaiian Health Project and so on. A lot of those people working for the state in these Hawaiian agencies have been working with different federal representatives to try and push federal recognition on Hawaiians. And that, that started before Obama through the 90s up through the end of the Obama administration. And it was really on pause once Trump took office. People thought, well, it's not like Trump's gonna recognize Hawaiian sovereignty or a nation within a nation. But now with Biden in office, you know, it's really the liberal inclusive model. So, you know, the Democratic Party will say, well, Hawaiians should have what American Indians have. And so they see it as an equity issue. And um, it's made for really complicated politics because you've got Hawaiian independence activists reaching out to right-wing Republicans who wanna stop any of this not because they support Hawaiian independence, but because they see any form of acknowledging Hawaiian self-determination as special rights, right? The classic sort of right-wing um, backlash. So with Biden, there's renewed discussions about federal recognition and also legislation that literally was up and running by December that was being proposed just last month that seems to be have been killed at least for now. There's a timeout of putting um, a casino on Hawaiian homelands territory on the island of Oahu as the first step to that further federalization of a subordinate Hawaiian nation, subordinate to both the 50th state and the federal government. And I say to the 50th state because unlike what federally recognized tribes have in the lower 48 states, I'm going to leave Alaska alone for a minute because it's different up there. States don't typically have any say over tribal sovereignty, but in the Hawaiian proposals, from the Bush administration into the Obama administration, the 50th state of Hawaii would have a say. So it's already lesser than. So, you know, that there's a lot going on right now that's on hold temporarily, but there's a lot of money to be made by people in um, state agencies that wanna see this through. So I'll, I invite people to keep their eye on Hawaii and also the incredible activist work to try and get, um, to really try and challenge US militarism in Hawaii and the environmental degradation, and then all the spin-offs of military culture, including uh, violence perpetrated against trans people in Hawaii and native Hawaiians are um, bear the brunt of that. 
So that's what I want to leave. Please keep your eye on that. And if you want more about the March 7th event on Hawaii Palestine, please drop me a line and I'd be glad to share that information with you. Thank you again, everybody, for listening and for these robust questions and for the generous um, hosting. I really appreciate um, getting to present my um, work in progress today. Mahalo nui loa. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks are rolling in through the chat and on behalf of the Center for Feminist Research and the Faculty of Health and all my Indigenous colleagues here at York University, we want to thank you again for coming out. We very much appreciate it and uh, we look forward to continued discussions. Thank you. Thank you all for attending.